So it is six o'clock. Welcome everyone to homebrew development for Nintendo 64. Kind of a strange topic, kind of a fun topic. Um, I believe I have 45 minutes, so let's see how far we can get. My name is Damien. I am a graduate of Ryerson, actually, computer science, graduated 2017. Um, I actually found this company, FDM, at a, not a hackathon, but a career fair. So I, I had a lot of fun at those career fairs. It's in, actually in between Ryerson and UFT. Uh, they rent like a giant space and, and they're all looking for programmers. So I always have fun going to those. I had fun going to those events as a student and now I'm on the other side of the booth trying to pitch FDM. So I won't talk too much about the company because I don't want to bore you, but you can check, check us out in the Discord. You can message either me or the FDM group user on Discord. You can just post in our channel as well if you have any questions. I think we have some job listings there. Job listings there. Basically, we're IT consulting. We hire new graduates. Uh, we train them for three or four months based in either software development, business analysis, project management, testing, big data engineering, um, really anything that's client driven. It's all based on demand. So we give you three or four months of training and then we place you at a two-year contract with one of our clients. Again, it's mostly finance, it's mostly uh, insurance, banks, and so on. Um, I did this as a two-year contract. Uh, this is my first job out of university. I had a lot of fun, and now I am a full-time trainer at FDM, uh, mostly teaching SQL, Unix, and Java. Lots of Java, especially Enterprise Edition frameworks, which I didn't learn in school. So. Uh, today we're talking about Nintendo 64, which is a console released in 1996, discontinued in 2002. And every year that I do this presentation, well, I don't do it every year, I mix it up. Uh, every year I do it, I, I realize that it's one year younger of a generation than the presentation last time. So fewer and fewer people are, are getting familiar with this. Um, the console sold 33 million copies, sorry, 33 million um, systems itself compared to its predecessor, the Super Nintendo was 49 million, its competitor, the PlayStation 1, 102 million, so relatively low. First, Nintendo console to have native four-player, to have analog on the controller, and to have 3D graphics. It had a very small library, actually, of 388 games. Again, its predecessor, Super Nintendo, 1,760 and its competitor, PlayStation 1, a whopping 2,852. So very, very small library on this thing. Uh, it was written in C for its, uh, the games were written in C, and it's notoriously difficult to program, which may be one of the reasons why it didn't have that many games. It had a high barrier of entry. It has, has a processor of 93.75 megahertz, has a whopping four megabytes of RAM, wow. So you may be wondering, why am I talking about a 25-year-old console? Uh, obviously, this is not related to FDM or what we do. It's just a fun kind of topic just to draw a crowd um, and enjoy, enjoy this hour that we have. Um, it's difficult to program in Nintendo 64 with little reward, especially today. This is an extremely small player base, especially today. If you, if you make a game in Nintendo 64, it's not going to sell that many copies. But um, I, like to have, I like to promote this idea of transferable skills. If you can code in C, which is difficult, then moving, transferring to Java will be relatively straightforward. But if you only know how to program in, in an easier language, in an easier environment, then shifting to something more difficult is going to be a hard time. And there definitely are some transferable skills going from C programming, and in particular, the stuff that we'll do today. I'll talk a little bit about the architecture, not too much. Um, this is the Nintendo 64's circuit board. On the left, you can see this CPU here with its 93.75 megahertz processor. Um, it has uh, the Reality coprocessor, which is co which consists of two parts, and that's kind of like a dedicated GPU. Which, is, which was a step up from, from the Super Nintendo. So now we have this idea of two different processors doing two different tasks. CPU mostly for, for logic and computation and, and math, whereas RCP is more for the 3D rendering. So you can almost think of it as CPU and GPU. Yeah, so two different processors, the Reality co 
pro coprocessor consists of reality signal processor and reality display processor. The reason we need to know these terms is because when you're setting up your graphics library environment, you actually need to call all these like small functions to set up this, set up that, load whatever registers. And that, that's a real hassle, but we're mostly going to skip over that. This is kind of an overview of the different tasks and commands necessary in making a Nintendo 64 program. You have your model data and your model sound. We write microcode to transfer it into the graphical binary interface command, which is basically a display list of commands that you're going to do um, to transfer this data into eventually uh, a picture and uh, some sound. So from that display list, we send it to the RSP and the RDP, the signal processor and the display processor, and we load up frames into the frame buffer. So exactly what is the world going to look like in the 3D game? And then what is it going to look like in the next frame? And then the next frame, same thing with the sound. Everything is calculated frame by frame into a buffer, like a list of what's going to happen. From that buffer, we load the frames into this uh, digital analog converter, and that sends it to the screen. This is the graphics pipeline, which I don't know about UFT's curriculum, but in Ryerson, we did have a computer graphics class. And it's quite interesting, actually, to see what in that curriculum is was actually relevant in 1996 as well. Um, so the fundamentals of OpenGL, Open Graphics Library, and 3D graphics programming actually hasn't changed that much. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go through every step, but it, it's a similar idea, right? We're starting from the model data. How do we represent data in the 3D world? How do we transform that data to make our final picture? And one of the ways we do that is with matrices. So we're going to see a demo of a basic a basic 3D object represented by a matrix. And this actually wasn't in the Nintendo 64 programming manual. So I had to deduce based on the code what was going on. I just had to look for something familiar. And one of the things I found was this array of vertices. Um, so these values here, if you, you look at it closely enough and study it, you'll realize it represents this box on the right. Um, so there's a bunch of different values here. X, Y, Z, 0, 0, 0, R, G, B, A. So uh, 10 different numbers uh, ranging from starting from ints and going to hexadecimal numbers. The first three numbers of each coordinate says what is the X position, what is the Y position, and what is the Z position in the 3D um, plane over here. And then the last four values are what is the red value, the green value, the blue value, and the alpha. So if you've ever done any kind of, um, if you've ever done CSS before, you've probably seen RGB. If you've ever um, like programmed those annoying like gamer lights on like your hardware, um, or if you've ever done, um, or if you've ever worked with like MS Paint and me messed with the values there, you're probably familiar with RGB, right? It's just a numerical way of describing a color. So um, red over here is full red, zero green, zero blue, and full alpha, which means entirely opaque. It's not transparent. And you can tell negative 64, negative 64, that's at the bottom left. And from then on, you can deduce all the other ones, right? Zero red, zero green, full blue is the bottom right. Zero red, zero green, zero blue means black. That's the top right. And finally, zero green is top left. So this is like a matrix coordinate, and this is how 3D objects are represented. Based on that 3D object that's represented as a matrix, we need to transform it. So if you've ever taken uh, linear algebra, you might find this familiar. Um, this is something that, this was a compulsory course for Ryerson Computer Science. I don't know about the U of T curriculum, but basically you have your original matrix and you have a matrix which represents your transformation. So um, over here, I have four, five, six, seven. That's my original data, let's say. Let's say that's a square. And then let's say zero, one, two, three 
is a transformation. So this second matrix means move everything to the right by 10 pixels or something like that. Or I can have a matrix saying rotate everything by 90 degrees. So the original data and the transformation matrix will eventually at the end produce a result matrix. So what is the original data? How do I transform it? What does it look like after it's transformed? That's kind of the fundamentals of 3D graphics. Um, if you want to learn more, check out, check, you must have some kind of graphics course in your curriculum. Um, mine was very, very similar to this at Ryerson. So we will take our vertex coordinates and transform them through the projection matrix, the translation matrix, and the rotation matrix. All of this was covered for me in CPS, I think 621 or something like that. Some of the tools I'm using here, I'm actually writing in a Windows XP virtual machine. Um, I'm not sure if this is possible in Windows 7 or 10 or 8, um, but uh, the, the emulator is nothing new. Uh, that works in Windows 10. I'm using Notepad++. Um, 3D rendering tools are, are kind of universal. It doesn't really matter um, as long as you can output it to a C file. The only thing that, the only reason I use it in Windows XP is because we'll see this batch um, command line program that sets a bunch of environment variables. So I, I think that one is system dependent. Uh, this, we compile it in command line using GCC, that's the C compiler. And new system is a series of tools. You're gonna see that in the source code. Uh, it just makes a lot of the setup easier. And here's a link to the software development kit. So I know I didn't really give you tools to follow along with this workshop. It's more, it's more kind of a one-sided presentation than it is uh, an interactive thing. It's just because the setup is so, um, the setup is not easy. There's some 3D rendering tools. You could use Maya is probably the easiest way to do it. And then using an object to C converter. So 3D models are going to be stored in C files. Um, Nintendo did not supply any proprietary 3D rendering software. That's okay. Um, Alias and Wavefront are, are two 3D rendering tools which existed back then. Um, I think Blender is probably the most popular one uh, today, as long as you can get into a C file, you can you can do this with with any program. Okay, so I'm mostly looking at I'm starting with this square, and then I'm going to transform it into uh, a pyramid, and we're going to implement a, a jump. So, good old Windows XP. I'm going to click full screen. And my overlay in Zoom has gone away now. I'm going to go back and can you just type chat if you can see this full screen Windows XP virtual machine? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, thank you. So Windows XP, times good times. Um, this is my new three demo, which I'm mostly going to show today. So it's a pyramid, it can be rotated and it can jump. And that's pretty much all I want to do. The setup for this is actually not that simple. So we're gonna dive through the source code and the only thing I'm really gonna implement is that jump. Um, I just want to make sure that I have multiple versions of this. I just want to make sure that I'm in the right one. files, obviously you can't read them in Notepad. I have just my uncompiled files here. Okay, so let's just start from main. Um, 
there's a lot of header files uh, and a lot of different imports. So if you're not familiar with C, this is probably going to be a headache for you. But the main method is actually really, really simple here. Um, there's a lot of initialization that we have to do. So anytime I'm using like any 3D graphics, I need to say new graphics in it. I need to initialize the controller manager in order to get input. I need to initialize the audio. I need to set, I need to register audio data on ROM. Initialize stage zero, which is kind of the main function that, that I'll actually be using. I know this one's called main but I'm kind of exporting most of the logic to stage zero. And I am setting my new graphics callback function. Um, if you've ever, if you've never seen callback functions, there's, there's kind of two main ideas of callback. One says a callback function is a function as a parameter. And the second definition will say a callback function is a function that is after another function has ended. These two definitions are not mutually exclusive, right? Um, the first one is is a large is kind of a, an over overarching definition that includes the second one, right? If I have a function as a parameter. I can call that parameter after the rest of the code has been run. What that basically means is I'm saying a while loop, just while one, right? And then every time this is finished, anytime this runs, I'm calling my callback function stage zero. Now stage here, stage zero um, is just going to call make display list zero zero and update game zero zero. So it's just how we're dividing the logic. It doesn't really, it's not really too important. So update game is zero, zero and make DL zero, zero are both in the stage zero, zero file. This is the main file that we're looking at. Okay. Um, before I look at stage zero, zero, the one thing I want to show you more than um, more than any of the less important stuff, is the main structure that I'm working with. And I'm calling this structure dynamic. If you've ever done C before, you might have written a struct. Uh, it's basically like a class in Java. So this is my definition for the class dynamic. I'm saying dynamic consists of a projection matrix, a modeling matrix, and a translation matrix. And this dynamic I'm going to be re referencing it all throughout the program um, because these three matrices are, they're kind of global, right? Every object is going to pass through these matrices. And I don't have the chat open just because it's tiresome to, to switch between them, but now's probably a good chance if there's any questions, if anyone wants to read them. And if there aren't, that's that's fine too. Okay, so I want to do some rotation, I want to do some movement, and I want to do a jump. Uh, I already have the jump done, but I, I do want to do that one from scratch. So again, um, these examples didn't have a lot of notes on them. So it, it's kind of like a deciphering for, it's like decipher the, the examples that are built into the software development kit, and then use that as a starting point to, to go and make your own stuff. So originally this was just a square. So I added rotation on this and I added the jumping on this. Um, one thing that I really want to stress is I am using these variables so that um, so that my game logic methods all um, fix functions. Then, I want my game logic to modify static variables so that the same graphics functions are different 
values. What does this mean? Let's take a look. So I said the, the functions I'm calling are init stage zero and make dl zero zero. Init stage zero is called once only, whereas make display list is being called basically 60 times a second. Um, what I said about um, I want to I want my graphics functions to run constantly with different values. That's mostly being done here. So I'm saying my dynamic pointer is a pointer to that dynamic object that we saw before. Uh, this one up here. I don't remember why I moved it up there, but uh, I'll just keep it up there because I know it works. So make that dynamic pointer, the pointer to that, those three matrices. I have to do graphics reality coprocessor in it, initialize. Graphics clear the frame buffer and the Z buffer and set up my projection modeling matrix. So here's my projection matrix. Here's my modeling matrix. And here's my translation matrix. Then I'm going to draw the actual, originally it was a triangle or a square, now it's a pyramid. And then I synchronize my display list and then I end display list, end display list with a pointer to the dynamic. Okay, so the main thing that, that I want you to take away from this is that the logic in shade try is actually going to change values. But these methods here, like ortho, rotate and translate, these are running basically every second with the values. So for rotate, I'm saying theta A, X, Y, Z. For translate, I'm saying translate position X, position Y, position Z. So I'm never going to have to mess with these three functions, ortho, rotate, and translate. They're just gonna stay where they are. And then the rest of my code is going to update these values so that rotate, translate, and ortho are called with new values. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so what am I actually modifying here? How am I changing those values? First, I'm doing it here. So if my control pattern is player number one, so player controller number one is plugged into the system. Um, yeah, I'm just displaying what those values are, x, y, z, theta, x, y, z. Uh, and here is update game. So, the two functions that are called every time are make display list and update game. What happens when I update game? Change triangle position X to be the controller data stick X. Change triangle position Y to be controller data stick Y. So that is on the analog stick of the controller um, left and right is X and Y is up and down. So I'm just saying change the position to be the value of the controller. Easy. We're going to write the jump in a second. And then the rotation here. So if I'm pressing B, if I'm pressing C up, if I'm pressing C down, C left or C right, then I'm going to rotate in a different manner. Now again, this is a lot of experimentation. Um, we can even write this from scratch. If I'm pressing C up, then I basically want theta A, B. Theta A is like, am I rotating forward or backward? And then theta X, Y, Z, that X. Yeah, theta, that X, that Y, that Z. That X, Y, and Z is, it's a, a, a vector for the direction in which I'm rotating. So if I'm rotating X equals one, Y equals zero, Z equals zero, that means I'm rotating around the X axis. And then A is just saying, am I rotating forward or backwards? Let's say X is one, uh, A is one, Y is zero, and 
z is zero as well. So when I press C up, I'm going in the X direction forward. When I press C down, let's say I'm going in the X direction backwards, so negative one. Let's just compile that already. We, we've, we've looked through enough code. Let's actually do the compiling. So this is a batch file. Um, it's in the N64 um, software development kit, the SDK. On N64.bat. And when I run this, this is what I mentioned earlier about um, all the various setup necessary. So I'm, I'm calling environment variables here. I'm setting some variables. I'm calling some other batch programs. And I don't really know what this stuff does. It just allows me to compile and it works. This is why I believe it's not compatible with modern operating systems. And that's why I'm using a Windows XP machine. Okay, so let's go to here. CD, uh, C slash Nintendo slash N64 kit slash newsys slash compiled. I'm looking at new three slash Amazon. And I call make in order to compile. So it has successfully compiled. And here is my output, new 3.n64. And you can tell it was made um, 626 right now. So that is indeed the right version. Okay, I press C up and C down, and it's rotating very, very little. I think I need to not just set it to one, but increase it, increment it by one, I think. Okay, I can control Z to see what it was before. Theta, theta A is equal to theta A plus one, my mistake. So I'm rotating in the x-axis. And then basically, if I'm one, I'm here. If I'm two, I'm here. If I'm 90, 180, and so on and so forth. Let's compile again. Okay, great. Up and down. Never mind that floor object, that gray box. That's uh, that's some other idea I had. Okay, so up and down is working. Unfortunately, the faces are not very good. You can see um, some faces should be in the background instead of the foreground and so on. Let's add rotation for the left and right. Um, so this is, in theory, theta. A is going to be positive one. Um, and instead of rotating in the x axis, let's rotate in the y axis. And for right, it's going to be the same thing, just in the negative direction. Like that. All right, left and right, up and down. I want to rotate in the Z direction, I can do that as well. So if I press B, I'm going to say, uh, go forward in Z equals one. Well, and that is Z rotation. So I believe the technical terms are roll, pitch, and yaw. I think this is a roll. I think this is probably a pitch. I think this is a yaw. Strange terms, I know. Um, let's do that jump now. So every time I call update game, I'm also calling jump. And I'd like to just make more modular methods, right? I don't want to do all the jump logic here. I want to put it in another function. So first thing I want in jump. Oh, right. Um, I also have um, that analog stick. So I have my translation as well. 
if I go up and down and left and right, um, the pyramid moves as well. So I want to, that's using the um, triangle position X and triangle position Y functions, which I declared at the top. Triangle position X, Y, and Z are being called in the translate method. So all I need to do if I'm implementing a jump is modify those triangle position variables, X, Y, and Z. So the first thing I want to do in jump is say, um, triangle position Y is equal to triangle position Y minus one every single frame so that it's going to fall gradually down. Okay, so we have our gravity. That's because it's um, I'm, that's because I'm um, contradicting it, right? I'm saying that the triangle position Y is where the controller is, and I'm saying it's uh, minus one. So here I'm saying it's zero, and then here I'm going to say it's minus one. So it, it doesn't doesn't work like that. Um, let's let's remove the controller. So I'm not going to move up and down with the analog stick. I hate games that do that. When you press up to jump instead of A, it's so annoying. I don't like that at all. Do we have gravity? Yes, we do. It's falling. OK, obviously, I don't want it to fall below 0. So let's say in jump, if I position y is less than, um, sorry, if it's greater than zero, then decrease it by one. Else, if it's not greater than zero, I'm going to say it's zero. It's no longer falling. Um, but I don't want it to decrease by one. I want it to increase to decrease by velocity. So I have this static float vel here. So that it doesn't just fall by one pixel because that's not how gravity works. Instead, it's going to decrease by velocity every second. And then velocity will decrease by 9.81 meters per second or whatever. So velocity equals velocity minus 10, something like that. And so if I make this now, I'm not going to be able to test if it works. I want to jump when I press A. So here is my controller. I say if cont data 0, that means the first controller, presses the a button. I believe that is the syntax. A button. And I'm going to say velocity equals minus 10. So if I have negative velocity, that means I go up. Um, I think 10 and 1 are good values. I'm not sure. So there is compile. I press A, velocity does not change. Triangle position Y equals triangle position Y minus velocity. If it's greater than zero. Uh, sorry, this should say if it's um, that's that's incorrect. This is saying if it's equal to zero. No. Um, Yeah, 
this is running either way. That's good. Velocity equals velocity minus 10. You know, let's just say just for testing purposes, let's say that triangle position y is 50. Just to see if A actually does something. I like to start small, you know, write very small tests to make sure that at least something is working and then increase from there. So I press A and it's increasing way too fast. So triangle position y, y equals 50 and it's increasing by 50 every frame. Because the velocity is, huh, weird. Okay, if I don't get this within the next minute, I have the code saved somewhere. So like a cooking show, I can bring up my final version. Um, yeah, I'll just take a look. Okay, if my triangle position is less than or equal to zero, that means I've gone too low. And so I halt all movement, my velocity is zero, and I halt the triangle. The triangle is equal to zero, I guess, the position. Um, jumped is actually not necessary. There's a way to do it without this. It's, it's kind of like a Boolean that I'm using it. Um, and then if it's not less than or equal to zero, then velocity decreases. So let's try that. If my triangle position is less than or equal to zero, that means I've fallen below the floor. And if I haven't touched the ground, that means I am falling. So if I've touched the ground, my velocity is zero. My triangle position, zero. And I am not jumped. Basically, the idea is I have a Boolean jump, which is either true or false. So if I just press A, then I'm in the air and my jump is true. Now, while I'm jumped, I don't want to jump again. So I'm saying if I'm already jumped, then disregard the A button. The reason it's an int is because I might have more than one state. I might have false, I might have true, but maybe I have double jump or something like that. So just to keep it open for the future, I want to allow more than two states. So jumped equals zero if I am on the ground. Else, if I am in the air and I am falling, then I say uh, velocity, minus equals one. And regardless of whether my velocity is zero or if my velocity is decreasing, I'm saying triangle position y minus equals velocity. And I think that is good. For, oh, let's add the, the um, A button. If jumped equals zero, then I want to do my A press. So if I press A button, then first of all, jump equals one. And then velocity equals, I, I think this should work. I think it's velocity equals negative 10. So my velocity goes, sorry, no, that's not true. Um, triangle position equals triangle position minus velocity. Let's just, let's just double check what's negative, what's positive. Okay, negative, negative is top left. So negative is up, I guess. It's, it works different in every system. OpenGL and Unity, I believe they have opposite coordinate systems. 
Um, and I think like Java Swing, even like the, nothing is really standardized. Okay, so let's say that negative means falling, positive means jumping, and the triangle position uh, increases by the velocity. So if I if my velocity is negative, then increasing by velocity means I go down. Increasing by positive means I go up. I think that looks good. Okay, it compiles, that's great. All right, so I press A and it jumps. So it goes up in the air, you can see triangle position Y, and it falls with at least somewhat realistic gravity, right? So when I jump, I have positive momentum and then my momentum goes down. And I can never jump twice in a row, right? I can't hold A and jump to the sky. So rotate. So I think I had 45 minutes allocated. So that brings us just about in time to um, close. You actually have a, uh, like maybe 10 more minutes. Oh, awesome. Okay, um, I just wanna show some other examples that I've got floating around. Um, just to show you kind of what's possible. Um, Uh, sorry, the, the Nusis ones are basic. There's more examples in Ultra. Yeah, if you've ever done, if I know uh, in, in 3D modeling, there is the equivalent of Hello World as a picture of a teapot. Uh, I think that like some history behind that of some university graphics class. One just left this on. But a teapot is kind of the standard, like first thing that people make. Uh, there you go. It's a teapot. It's possible with three D rendering. You got the texture in the background. I didn't go over texture mapping, but. Um, there is a tool for that I'm using. It's called like RGB one something. I think it is possible to use GIMP as well. GIMP is a, is a photo editor. Here's, yeah, texture editor and GIMP. You basically have to make it in one format and then convert it to another format. And your textures are also going to be in C. Um, but that's kind of the next step in 3D rendering. So we've got controllers working. We've got projection, translation, rotation. Um, after that, you want to make your own 3D models using a 3D modeling program. Uh, you want to make your own textures and then you want to make sound. There's a lot of stuff to do here. Hopefully this is kind of a decent intro. Um, I didn't really talk about the coordinates that much. In the, yeah, in the shade try function, I skipped over this one. Um, <laughs> again, we really have to do things manually step by step. So here I've declared what my shape is, uh, sorry, not floor, but in, in here, my four vertices, blue, red, yellow, and green. You can see in the running version, blue is at the top, green is in the middle, yellow and red are, are the floor. So yellow and red are negative 40 in the X, zero Y, zero Z. Blue is right in the middle in X, high up in Y, and then green is in the middle, but poking forward in the Z axis. And then when I have these four vertices defined, how to actually draw the faces, the 3D figures is really interesting. So first I have to load the vertices from the vertex objects into the vertex buffer index. So I'm saying load GSP vertex 
and blue goes to index one and red goes to index sorry index zero index one yellow goes to two and green goes to three so once again one two three sorry zero one two and three these are my four vertices i've loaded them in the index buffer now to make the triangles i need to convert those i need to um read from the vertex buffer and draw triangles. So I'm saying GSP one triangle, pointer to the display list, zero, one, two, and then the fourth variable is just like a flag if it's on or off or something like that. So triangle one, sorry, vertex zero, vertex one, vertex two. Um, just draw this in paint. I've de defined the four vertices as one, two, sorry, I keep forgetting, one, zero, one, two, and three. And then to connect those triangles, I need to say I'm drawing a triangle between zero, one, and three. I'm drawing a triangle between two, three, and one. I'm drawing a triangle between zero, two, and three. And finally, I'm drawing a triangle between zero, two, and one. So I've got four faces in total, four triangles that make up this pyramid. Obviously, if you have a more 3D, if you have a more complex 3D program, you're not going to do it uh, vertex by vertex. You would have like a script that loads all this and, and does it for you. Um, and you would never define your vertices. You would never hard code them, right? Um, I'm not sure why I was frozen, but that's about as much time as we have. So I um, hope you enjoyed watching this. I know it was a little fast. It was a little hard to follow just because it's kind of out there. Um, but yeah, let's, any questions or anything, would you recommend resource wise for people who'd like to learn more? I'm posting this in the discord right now. Um, I have the same, I did the same one for Ryerson. So under um i guess i'll put it in the sponsor fdm although it's, there's no like workshop fdm channel that's fine um i'll post this exact demo so n64 demo and that comes with a document setting up a nintendo 64 development environment so this zip file and also the slideshow from earlier there's also a link in the slideshow so i'm posting that right now powerpoint Me some tea, yeah, it's a good teapot. Any fans, any favorite N64 games out there? I know I when I would go to these in person, it'd be a lot more fun. We'd have like uh, Super Smash Bros. set up and I would bring my old TV and like an N64. And it's got like, um, it's got like a flash drive, which is, it's like an R4 for DS. It's got like a bunch of games on it. We'll go on Snap, it's a classic. Um, and it would just always bring a crowd. We would, you know, we just have some fun. Like I was only paid to be there for an hour or two to do the workshop, but I just stay there anyway. <laughs> also, I got free food, so that's pretty sweet. That's awesome. Um, I did think there there are two other questions. So, is there a way I can try this on my own? I think you were posting the slides and the demo zip. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's that zip file. Um, you know what, I'll, I'll also include the, the batch program. Um, I think that's the only thing that's, that you actually need is the batch in order to compile mm -hmm. and some kind of source code. Um, yeah, let me, let me add that batch as well. Frozen, which it might be. Okay. Discord even lets me do this. Um, 
Um, you do need a, a Windows XP virtual machine, uh, maybe, as far as I know, maybe there's other systems as well. Uh, if N64 came out in 96, then it probably works in Windows 95, but I, I'm guessing none of you have Windows 95 set up. <laughs> Can you run it on Mac? How strong do I have to be? You gotta be, you gotta be pretty decent at C. Um, yeah, the, there's some multi-threading involved. Um, it, it, at least you should know like loops and ifs and arrays very, very well and pointers. You definitely got to know pointers. Um, but beyond that, you don't need to know like, I, I, I don't know advanced C myself. So I, I, I was man I managed to, to swim in this. Can I run it on Mac? Hard, hard to make that call. Um, probably not, but I, you know, never say never. You can have a Windows XP virtual machine in Mac. Okay, so if there's nothing else, I hope I can see some of you next year, unless you're graduating, that's excellent. But hopefully we can do this in person um, because I, I actually live at Bay and Bloor. So it's just a small walk and I get paid to go to these hackathons. So I always have a lot of fun. Thank you so much. That was a really great workshop and seeing the demonstration was awesome. Awesome. Feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Feel free to ask any questions on, on my Discord. Uh, you can message me about FDM, about what we do. Um, we have jobs if you're graduating soon. We don't hire, um, we don't do co-ops, unfortunately, just full-time recent graduates. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, you posted some links to job openings on the sponsor FDM channel. So anyone looking for a job, please make sure to check it out. Awesome. Thanks everyone for, for watching. Uh, 